So your question is, when I design a new lock, is it, say, say, to expose the, ca you're saying to expose the caches in my lock design. No, I'm, I'm missing what you're saying. I'm sorry. S say it again. In the NUMA node, Oh, to have shared caches in the NUMA node. Uh, they do have a shared cache, the NUMA nodes. It, the problem is not that, so each NUMA node, okay, if I'm, in a, if I'm in this environment that I described, okay, each node does have, um, actually, in, the, in these, okay, in this benchmark, um, the NUMA nodes do have shared caches. They're each, each one of them is a, uh, a multi-core with a shared cache. So imagine that each NUMA node, okay, is essentially one, uh, you know, a, ha a Haswell processor, okay? So it has a, a shared L3 in it. So each node has a shared L3. Still, the, the lines will bounce between them if I don't take care. And that's what I'm trying to show. So they do have a shared uh, cache inside the node. Questions? Okay. Did I answer your question? So-so. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so great. So, what is the conclusion from all these locks that Nir has talked about? Okay. Um, you know, I've shown you a whole collection of locks, and here is the conclusion from the whole thing. Okay? When you actually go to solve the problem, you have to try out and see which one fits. There's no one solution, okay? Um, as you'll see in, in other data structures that people will present, often doing the simplest thing and not the compl most complex thing is the easiest and gives the best performance, okay? But, but maybe, Maybe your impression now, after, you know, after this whole uh, lecture of mine, right, is, you know, that, you know, Amdahl's law um, really works. If I reduce the granularity, right, of the locking, okay, and I make, you know, the, uh, you know, I get this uh, shared part, you know, to be highly parallel, right, then everything is great, and I'm going to get great performance, okay? Um, right? So, I, here's, here's the thing that I, I, I want to say. Um, are we sure that we can draw the right conclusions from Amdahl's law? And this reminds me of a story. So, um, you know, in, um, in Jewish tradition, we have, um, we have these uh, people from a town called Chelem, okay? And people from Chelem are supposed to be really stupid, okay? And we tell a lot of jokes about people from Chelem. And I want to tell you one of them, okay? So three guys from Chelem want to join the FBI, okay? And so they show them uh, you know, a, a photo of a suspect in profile, okay? And the first one looks at the, fo at the photo and he says, oh, he only has one ear. And the second one looks at the uh, photo and he says, oh, he only has one eye. And the third one looks at the photo and he says, oh, he's wearing contacts. See, what? Wearing contacts? They run to the file, they open the file up, and yeah, the guy is wearing contacts. He says, but how did you know? He says, well, with one eye and one ear, how could he wear glasses? <laughs> so this is what I want to tell you, okay? I want to tell you, okay, that you think that Amdahl's law is great, but we're forgetting an eye and an ear, okay? And the eye and an ear is essentially the overhead of all this synchronization, Okay, so all this synchronization that I do to get the fine grain synchronization sometimes is bigger, okay, than what I would do if I had a single lock. 
And so I want to show you what you can do with a single lock, okay, even if it is a big, bad old lock, okay? And so, so here's what you can do. You can take one lock, okay, and this is uh, uh, Oyama et al.'s uh, algorithm, and what you're going to do is this. As the thread, let's say I have a shared object and I have one big lock protecting it, okay? So what I do is, okay, you know, I combine the lock requests. So, comes a guy, wants to access the lock, you know, grabs it. The next guy that comes and doesn't get the lock adds himself to a list, okay? He does this with kind of a uh, compare and swap operation, adds himself to a list, okay, of requests for the lock. Okay, so far it looks a lot like MCS. Here's another guy, he adds himself to the list of the requests to the lock, okay? Now, this guy that got the lock, okay, before going into the, do the critical section, collects all the requests of everybody else. So let me just say this again. He disconnects the pointer so nobody else can see these requests, and then he goes and he grabs and all these requests, okay, and he just goes and applies them to the data structure. So this one guy applies all the operations to the data structure, okay, and then he goes and returns the answers to all the guys in the list. He knows who they are because he collected them from the list. Okay? And then he can go and release the lock. Why would this be better than having them each do the operation on the data structure? Why is this better, guys, having him do this than them doing it? Yes, please. Because of cache locality, right. Because if one guy is doing this operation on the, all these operations on the data structure, he has cache locality. Is this clear? Right? This is a good, this is an advantage. Okay? Still, okay, so it improves cache behavior and reduces the contention because they're not competing on the object. Um, but it's still not great. It's still not great because I'm still doing a compare and swap on the lock and I'm doing a compare and swap on this local list that I have. Okay? Okay. So what I want to show you is a protocol which we call flat combining, where we do this kind of combining, okay? But we're going to do it without compare and swap coordination operations and we're going to do combining N more than just naive combining, we're actually going to use the fact that we are doing a whole bunch of operations together in order to gain an advantage. Okay? So, here's how I do flat combining. So what I do is this. I have my, ob I have my object, I have a lock, and I have a counter next to the lock. I'm going to explain the counter in a second. And I have a list. We call this the publication list. Okay? Every thread is going to have one node in the publication list. Okay? This node is, go is going to be, unlike with Oyama, it's going to stay around for more than one um, request to access the lock. So as long as I'm accessing the lock, okay, I'm going to have my node in the publication list. Okay? So, what happens now is this. Let's say that the blue guy wants to enqueue something, okay? So he goes and he writes down, I want to enqueue, and he writes it in his publication, and he says, I want to enqueue D, okay? And goes, tries to access the lock, managed to get it, great, he's happy. This guy, the yellow guy, wants to do a DQ. Tries to grab the lock, fails. Then he goes and he spins. He spins waiting for somebody else to complete his DQ for him. Okay, so he's spinning on his record. Here's another guy, a red guy. He wants to do a DQ too. His record is not in the list. So he adds himself, you know, he adds the record, his publication record to the list, adds the DQ, and uses a compare and swap to add himself to this list one time. Okay, for this one t first time he adds himself to the list and then he spins. And now, 
the blue guy goes and collects all the requests and applies them to the object, just like in Oyama, okay? And he can do that again, okay? He can repeat this, you know, the blue guy can do this several times, okay? And all these guys, every time that they want to uh, do a, a request, they just update their record for the next one and get an answer and update. So, they're, so the, whoever owns the lock for a while is going to be updating you know, the answers for all these guys. So they're going to publish and he's going to collect and they're going to publish and he's going to collect. Okay? Now, it turns out that if you do this, you can actually have threads post what they want to do and have the guy who owns the critical section at that time, okay, apply the operations without any kind of synchronization at all. You don't need a compare and swap, you don't need to allocate a record, you just use what's there and you just combine the, the requests. You need to do a cleanup though. And the way you do a cleanup, okay, is, you know, why we use this counter. So every time that we have a combiner, a new guy that's doing all this combining for everybody that grabs the critical section, we increment this counter. Okay, so the, nu the numbers here are actually the numbers of the last guy, okay, that, that actually, uh, you know, that w the last time that I did a request. So this guy, you know, his last request was answered by 53, this guy by 54, and so on and so forth. And here is somebody, the last time that he had a request was when the 12th combiner was here, okay? And so, you know, you traverse, the combiner traverses, and when he sees old timestamps like this, he just cleans those records out. So if somebody for a while accessed the lock and then stops accessing it, then I remove them from this publication list so the list won't be too long. And, you know, if somebody reappears, then I have to add him to the list. Okay? And if I do this, the cleanup, because there's one thread that's doing the cleaning and he's the guy who owns the lock, I don't need to synchronize on that either. So there's really no synchronization. Okay? Yes. What? The, this counter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So who is incrementing it? Hold on. Uh, overflow. Use 64 bits. Be nice to yourself. <laughs> Uh, which, co which counter? This one? No, no, no. So whoever owns the lock updates the, c the counter. This counter is just after I grab the lock, then I update the counter. So the next guy who owns the lock will look at the counter and increment it. Okay? Yes. Ah, so there is no fairness here. This, this thing is not trying to order the requests here. So this guy could post it, and then this guy could post it, then this guy could post it. And so the, there is no um, fairness in the order of requests here. Okay? But think of it. This is as fair as if the threads themselves were being stopped and started. There's, n there's no real difference here. That's a great paper for SPA, right there. Okay, I don't know. Okay, so yes, good. Maybe if, if this is the case, if it's necessary, then maybe one can build a mechanism for that. But this, this doesn't do it, I agree, yeah. I, so what he's saying is you could implement this directly in the hardware, and I, I'm going to agree with you. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to even say you don't even need to do this in the heart. You can just do this in a message passing way. This, what is this? What, is the, what I described here is, is essentially producer-consumer, right? It's, it's essentially, it's a server and, and clients. So it's just a client-server model, okay? And all I'm trying to say is, okay, all I'm trying to say is, instead of all this fine-grained locking, Nir just talked for two and a half hours about these fine-grained locks, and I'm saying, okay, forget that for a second. Let's try to think what happens if I do, you know, producer-consumer, okay? If I do server-client, what happens? Well, here's what happens, okay? So what I'm going to claim is that I can now implement things in a very efficient way. I want to show you this, okay? So how? How, how does this flat combining thing, this, this client-server model, take me to a new place? What is the miracle that happens here, okay? So imagine my fine grain. I, I implement a fine-grained uh, queue. This is the uh, Melo, Crummy, and Scott queue, okay? Uh, sorry, the the mellow. It's uh, Scott and uh, and who? And Michael, Michael and Scott Q. Thank you, thank you. So the Michael and Scott Q. Um, so I have compare and swaps on the head, compare and swaps on the tail. You know, not easy. Okay. Um, here's how I would do that with flat combining. So I have my flat combining mechanism. I take the queue, sequential queue, and I stick it in here, okay? Stick it in there, okay? And now I run this with flat combining, okay? Great, that's good. But here, I can do more than that. When I combine, when I have this one guy doing the, all the operations, you know, if, if, if I did, if I wanted to do really fat nodes, let's say, let's say I wanted to do a node in the queue that was the width of a cache line, okay? then I can't, if I tried to do that with fine-grained synchronization, good luck to you, you know? How are you going to fill in the locations in this? You need a counter for that, that's a shared counter, so you do fetch and add, a miss. But if one guy is updating it, just have fat nodes, right, that are the width of a cache line, and now immediately you get a lot of cache locality in your queue. And you can do this because there's only one guy doing this. So if I'm combining all the operations, I go through the list, I collect all the things that I want to insert, I stick them in one node and I put that node in there and I'm all cache friendly and cache local. When I want to DQ stuff, I go and I collect all the requests and I just access the cache line once and I take everything out. Okay? So I can do smart combining here, right? And what, what do I get? You know, the fat node that, that is easy sequentially couldn't have been done without the sequentiality, but once I have the flat combining, I can do this. What do I get? What do I get from this? Well, here's the performance. Look at this, okay? This blue thing is Oyama, okay? Um, sorry, the green thing is Oyama, okay? Um, the blue thing is Michael Scott, okay? This is the basket queue. These are all kinds of, you know, fine-grained queue implementations. You see this? All these guys, right? Um, this is a combining tree, okay? So it's doing combining, but in a tree structure with a lot of synchronization. And this, okay, this is the flat combining. What happens here? Well, you know, up to, you know, 30-something processors, you know, it's, what is it, a factor of 10 faster than this. More, it's more than 10. It's maybe 30 times the, sp you know, speed up on Oyama. Okay? This is my fine, these are my fine-grained implementations, okay? And this is what I get by having this big fat lock, okay? And here it deteriorates because my publication list gets longer a little bit. Okay? And I'm not getting more parallelism. But you can see that it just shoots up into the sky. Why? Why is it doing that? Well, let's understand this. Okay? So, flat combining is in red. Here's, you know, um, the uh, number of... This is the, this is the graph of the throughput that I showed you before. Right? This is, this is the flat combining. Okay? In operations per... Second, so this is its throughput, okay? Look at the number of CAS 
uh, operations per op. This is a logarithmic scale, okay? These guys, okay, are here, okay? On this logarithmic scale, somewhere in the thousands of, of CAS operations, okay? Because of they're all competing all the time. And look at, you know, this is the, the, the uh, you know, this is a combining tree. And look at this flat combining. It's orders of, as, as concurrency increases, I get a decrease in the number of CASs per operation because something is published into the list and then you don't do any synchronization anymore. So there's no CASs. Okay? This is three orders of magnitude less CAS operations. Um, this is uh, CAS failures. Also, you know, a couple of order of magnitude less. This is cache misses, L2 cache misses. Look at this. These guys are all, as I increase concurrency, more and more and more and more and more cache misses. Okay? So even though they might be, you know, getting more operations done, they're paying a bigger price, and so they're not increasing. Everybody's losing here. Whereas the flat combining just remains flat or even goes down in terms of the cache misses. Okay? And so that's why I'm getting this ridiculous, you know, performance out of one lock. Okay? Um, here's a linearizable stack. Okay? So, again, this is, uh, you know, this is a lock-free stack, which Danny will talk about in the next lecture. This is elimination stack, which Danny will talk about in the next lecture. And this is the flat combining, right? Tribal lock free stack, elimination stack, and flat combining. Look, so it's deteriorating here, okay? But it's beating all through these, this concurrency level, it's beating the other guys very easily, okay? And this is a bug, okay? This should have kept on going up. This is probably an operating system thread, okay? Um, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, Moran Safrir, who invented this algorithm, uh, passed away before, um, you know, really seriously she did. And so uh, we, we don't have a way to fix this, unfortunately. can write the code again and try it, but I didn't. So anyway, um, and what if I want to implement a priority queue? Well, here's the thing about a priority queue. I can stick it directly into the, oh, question. Yes, so this is not that great in terms of latency. This is really a throughput play. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they are f th That's true. So they are free, okay, but, you know, there is a there is some cost. So I, I what I meant by, by by when when I said it's free, I d I didn't mean that if you generate a thousand compare and swaps, it's free. Okay. Um, no, I think you would probably get something uh, similar. It's <laughs> it it's free but it's still an operation on the bus. You're still paying the cost, okay? So what happens, what, what used to happen on these architectures, let me just say it, what used to happen on these architectures when you issued a compare and set, it, it really locked the bus. That was terrible. Now it doesn't lock the bus anymore. So the cost has gone way down. But um, if you compare, for example, a compare and swap to a fetch and add, a fetch and add is still a significantly more efficient operation than a compare and swap on these architectures. But it is nowhere near the cost of when it was locking the bus and, and that, then it was horrendous and we had to avoid it at all costs. Okay? Yeah. But I think really if you look here, you can see that one of the dominating things really is the cache performance here, which is causing a lot of the, 
behavior that you're seeing. Because I'm, because I'm using these fat nodes, I'm reducing the cash costs, and that, that is a big thing. Um, so let me go back here. So if I want to build a priority queue, I can take a skip list data structure. Okay, I don't know how many of you know what skip lists are, but if you did build a skip list, which is like a, a, a search tree, and what you could do to build a priority queue, a concurrent priority queue, okay, and, um, is essentially to have threads traverse down the bottom, okay, and um, you know mark the bits uh, of the of you know of nodes as being removed. So if you do this kind of thing, okay, and then you go and you remove the node from the list, this would be a concurrent implementation of a of a uh, priority queue. And in this implementation, k delete min operations would take k log n. Now, in the flat combining session situation, what you could do, okay, is collect k delete min requests, okay? Now you have k of them. So what you do is you traverse k locations down the list, because you're the only guy here. You, you traverse k locations down the list. You find the key in the kth location, and then as you traverse down this list to the kth, you know, using this key, you just remove all of this in one shot. So you don't have to do all this kind of manipulation of the list. You just throw it all away as you went down. So the cost goes down to k plus log n. Okay? And so this intelligent combining, okay, will give you the following. If this is a lock-free skip queue, and this is the lock-based skip queue, this would be the flat combining skip list-based queue. And you can see, even though it's sequential, while these guys are concurrent, it's outperforming them. Okay? And what's more amazing is, is this thing. What is this red thing up here? Well, believe it or not, this one is just if you take a sequential pairing heap out of the literature, as is, and plug it into the flat combining, you get this. So you don't even have to think. You just stick it in, and this is the performance that you get. OK? Cool. And here it is on an Intel architecture. So let me summarize, OK? So, what we saw is a whole lot of lock implementations that allow us to design concurrent data structures with very fine granularity. And we really have to pick the right lock in order to design, you know, this fine-grained locking. And many times when I look for scalability and I have to com combat with Amdahl's law, then I will use uh, you know, a fine-grained locking scheme, whether it's MCS or CLH or, or a, uh, you know, or a cohort lock and so on, okay? Um, but let's just remember, as we go to program, that often, okay, it might just be a great idea to just put a global lock over your data structure and just forget it or do flat combining and forget it, okay? So it's not as if, you know, we have to commit to one or the other. We really should be trying. Okay? And with that, thank you very much. So I guess if there are any further questions. Yes. Right. So, so one thing you might want to do is, is use your operating system to uh, not allow the thread that does the combining to be uh, preempted. You could. Yeah, so on many operating systems you can do that. You can prevent it from being preempted. And that would solve your problem. I agree, it's not a good thing. But if it gives you performance, 
then it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Sorry. It's a kind of it's a it's a it's the version of a of a heap that you would use today, except for maybe a binomial heap. So it's a just look at, look up in the literature. This is the popular thing today to do a pairing heap because the local overheads in a pairing heap are less than a Fibonacci heap, for example. So Fibonacci heap theoretically is better, but in practice the constants are higher, and in a pairing heap they're lower, and so it's it's the thing to use. Oh, you're asking, is access to the, to the data exclusive? Yes, only one thread, right. And only one thread is accessing the data structure and doing the operations for the others, right? So the win here is because it has a lot of cache locality and, it ca and we can combine the requests in interesting ways. Does this answer your question? Yes, yes. Yes, so in a, you're saying that in a NUMA setting, I, I'm, this might be a little bit more complex. And I, I think that uh, what you'd actually see in a NUMA setting is that this is a, uh, a win as long as... Um, yeah, it, it, it's a win depending on what the um, data structure you're updating is, right? So if the data structure you're updating um, has a lot of uh, locality in terms of the different nodes, then this would not help. This would be very bad, actually. Yeah. Well, I think this is not a scheme that is very good in a in a NUMA scheme that is not cash coherent, it's not, it would not deliver good performance. Yeah. Yes. So I didn't hear the beginning of your question. So you... Would I use flat combining when I had a bigger critical section? Oh, a collection of data structures. That's an interesting question. I don't know the answer. I think it depends. It depends what, you're, what it is that you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, no, I think I, what I showed was actually beyond that. So what happens when you go beyond the number of physical threads, then you don't get parallelism, but you get uh, 64, I think, is 60... Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I think what would typically... Um, what would happen is that most likely flat combining would deteriorate long before. Yeah. So I think when you started to get into hyper-threading, it would already start to deteriorate. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good thing to test. I, I, I'm going to guess it's going to be system-dependent. I, th I think there's no one answer. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah, thank you.